My name is Melissa Calarezu and I am the Neil McKendrick Lecturer in History at Keys and co-creator of two exhibitions at the Fitzwilliam with uh, Vicki Avery and Mary Lavin in 2015 and with Vicki in 2019. Um, I'm gonna chair the panel today and um, I've had the privilege actually of working with two of the panelists from the Fitzwilliam this evening. Um, and I have to say that the co-curation of the two exhibitions was a really exceptional and unusual opportunity for a historian to be involved with engaging wider publics through an art exhibition. It's not often that historians get that opportunity. And um, one of our panelists, Bernard Fulda, has also had that opportunity, so he'll be talking about that. Public engagement um, relates to the efforts of those working in public art collections to engage with as wide a public as possible. And this is often difficult because of the nature of the collections themselves. Many objects are collected in the past, really following elite tastes or institu institutional interests. And these collections often require uh, specialized interpretation, sometimes even reinterpretation to make them accessible as well as interesting and relevant to wider publics in particular for those people or those communities who um, don't normally go to museums. So we'll be hearing about some of those efforts this evening. Art exhibitions can also become the focus of public debates, especially in relation to past histories. Curators, curators often have discussions about what to include in an exhibition, what to not, to, what to take, to take away, in order to tell new stories and reinterpret objects and paintings in new ways. So we've got um, three panelists um, who will talk to us about how museums engage with the general public through community programs, exhibitions, and social media. And I'd like to introduce you to them now um, and in the order in which they're actually going to speak as well. So Victoria Avery is a keeper of applied arts in the Fitzwilliam Museum. Bernard Fulda is a former research fellow at Keys, um, 2002, and the Chetong So Fellow and Director of Studies and History at Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge. Rachel Sinfield is Head of Communications and Engagement at the Fitzmilliam Museum. So thank you very much to the three of you for coming this evening. Our panelists will take, will, will make about a 10, uh, short 10 minute presentation. And after their presentations are complete, we'll then have a Q&A session of about 30 minutes. Um, you're invited to submit questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen when during the presentations or during the Q&A session is really up to you. And you're also welcome to indicate whether you want the question addressed to one of the panelists or to all of the panelists. I've also been asked to let you know that the presentations will be recorded, but the discussion won't be recorded. Um, okay, so that's, that's it. So thanks again very much for coming, the three of you, and also to our, our uh, webinar participants. So Vicky, I'll hand it over to you. Melissa, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm now going to um, <clears throat> share my screen and I hope that um, you can now um, all see my screen nice and large. Yep. Um, so I have got um, quite a large deck of slides, but um, as Melissa knows, I always think that images speak a thousand words. So I'm just going to spend the next 10 minutes or so just really quickly whizzing through um, these slides and I hope that by the end of it you'll get a very clear idea about um, how we try to make this particular case study, Feast and Fast, The Art of Food in Europe 1500 to 1800, an exhibition that I co-curated with Melissa um, from October 2019 through uh, spring of 2020, um, as engaging and as memorable uh, and as relevant to uh, as broad an audience as possible, whilst also highlighting um, some of the treasures in the Fitzwilliam Museum and other Cambridge University uh, museums. So, um, as you probably are aware, when you put up a major exhibition, there are various sort of key outputs. And what I will be talking to you this evening about is obviously the exhibition itself, less so about the catalogue, although we did try to make that um, fairly priced, lots of lovely pictures and accessibly written to make it engaging. Um, the website, which remains up after the exhibition, so it's a very good platform to continue conversations and public engagement once the exhibition has gone down. But again, I won't be saying so Sorry much about interrupt you. Can you put it into full screen mode? Sorry, I thought I was. Um, let me try that. Does that work? Perfect, thank you. Sorry, excuse me, everybody. Um, and then the um, learning and engagement programme, which I will be talking about, which is done very much in collaboration with people like Rachel and her colleagues in learning to try to make it as 
um, rich and diverse and as um, relevant to, as I say, the broader uh, publics. So what I want to start off with uh, now is a section of slides thinking about how as a curator, you try to bring um, these historic objects alive and make them stunning to look at, very theatrically lit. They've got a context through the didactic material and the other objects with which they're displayed, but in a way to bring, I say, maybe bring them to life in, 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 in new ways. Um, so this is just an example of this wonderful uh, Renaissance Limoges enamel dish. Um, it's normally displayed like this, so it's sort of um, um, hung vertically uh, on, on the wall, but it's got this rather wonderful um, background. The underside of it is painted equally as beautifully as the front, and we were quite keen that the public, when they saw this enamel dish, understand it, understood better its functionality. So you can see here uh, with the arrow that in the display, it was, it was, it was displayed with a number of other very uh, elite um, uh, dining wares, but it was laid flat rather than being hung horizontally. And beneath we placed a mirror so that actually the public could understand that the underside was painted as well. Now, many exhibitions have, uh, you know, wonderful works of art, and we were obviously keen to highlight some of our fantastic paintings around the theme of feasting and indulgence uh, and so on. So this is a wonderful Antwerp painting around 1630, showing um, some very decadent, as it, it, these are the Jews in the desert um, um, feasting away, and you may be able to make out peacock pies on the table and um, roasted birds and, and luscious fruit and also all the dining paraphernalia. Um, or another typical example, again, the museum has wonderful Dutch examples of still life with lobsters and citrus fruits. Um, or um, a rather more hard to take on board, perhaps, especially if you are a vegan or vegetarian, this hunter comes butcher with um, uh, all the, the fowls and the beasts of the field ready to be sold. But what we wanted to do was bring these paintings alive. Um, and we brought in a wonderful collaborator, um, Ivan Day, um, whom you can see here, to recreate in 3D um, some uh, historically accurate um, feasting scenarios. So Ivan is a great maker of pies. Um, and we got his taxidermist friend to source us ethically a swan, a pheasant, a peacock, and so on, and some wonderful lobsters. Um, so that we could recreate um, a Baroque feasting table. So you may be able to just to make out that the historic artifacts, the, the glassware, the uh, standing cups, uh, some of the pewterware and the knives are actually displayed in the context of food. So with the paintings in the background, so actually uh, the, the 2D representations become um, like a mise-en-scene um, with the uh, historical artifacts and the, the food recreated. Ivan Day similarly made us a wonderful Tudor sugar banquet. And again, we were able to use our um, historical items, these wooden trenchers, the glassware, uh, the bride knives and so on, but in the context of um, the sugar um, platters, um, the sugar banqueting house, uh, and so on. So people could understand better the look and the feel and the use of these objects in the historical setting. And you can see here, this is the Tudor Sugar Banquet in the context of the exhibition where we had a contemporary quotation talking about the use of um, sugar plate to make fake platters, dishes and glasses and such like things where with it you may furnish a table and when you've done, you can eat them up. So it explains the fun aspects of this particular table. And finally, we got Ivan to make us a double-sided display that visitors had to physically walk around to recreate a Georgian confectioner's shop. So one of the windows was the front window, as it were, again, with the historical glassware, the porcelain plates uh, and the sweetmeat dishes uh, shown with, as it were, exotic fruits, uh, pineapples and oranges, and then with all the cakes and the sweeties that were, would have been sold by the confectioner. And then round the back, the workshop with all the tools. 
Other collaborators we worked with to try to make the exhibition as engaging as possible were artists. So Bompus and Pa, um, this wonderful London-based duo, we wanted to make um, a, a, um, a feature of um, our pineapple railings and the fact that our founder, his grandfather, had been the first chap in the UK to grow pineapples. Um, and so we got them to inst uh, create a giant architect tonic pineapple for our front lawn. You can see it being um, a dawn raid being lifted in and installed um, in the early morning light um, to create a centerpiece on our front lawn that would actually in intrigue people off the pub pavement and to help first time visitors get over the phenomenon of um, threshold fear. And you can see some school children and our friends from Rowan Arts Centre, these learning disabled adults engaging with that giant architectonic pineapple. And inside, um, through conversations, and I'll explain a little bit more about this in a minute, with our various audiences, um, we wanted to try to have non-visual um, emphases as well to do with food, the smells, the touch, and so on. And so this mini multi-sensory pineapple, you could touch it and then you could squeeze the pump and then pineapple mist would float out of it. And so you get something like a multi-sensory experience. Another idea was getting the exhibits, as it were, to talk to one about themselves. So we had this idea about um, a museum in a box. This idea, it's, 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 it's using technology and it's a way that normally one engages perhaps um, autistic children with artworks where, as I say, the artworks um, become personified and they speak to one. So we have um, these boxes where you had postcards and 3D objects of exhibits in the exhibition and you would place them on these speakers with headphones, as you can see this student demonstrating here. And the, the little lobster, as it were, would speak to one. Um, and I think that this audio, this rather unusual person, you know, first person audio was another interesting way of engaging viewers with the exhibits. We also got local artists to think about um, how they might respond to exhibits in the show. So uh, this particular local artist, Susanna Bangham, um, responded to this um, Tudor um, swan mark register by creating some swan prints. This central one um, was the uh, design for the museum in a box when it was taken off site to be used, for example, in hospices and um, at, at Addenbrooke's Hospital. Um, and then she also created uh, these designs that went on the wall in the creative zone above the museum uh, in a box. You see this label that we explained about um, bringing museum collections to everyone with through creativity and collaboration. And this is um, why we got Susanna to make those um, modern interpretations of the swans. We also wanted to record our engagement with the public through um, a couple of um, uh, community uh, food films. So we got Egg and Spoon to come in, a wonderful uh, Linda Mason and James Ratty to record our um, journeys of discovery and engagement with three particular community groups. Our longest engagement was with our friends at Rowan Art Centre, this local art centre for learning disabled adults. And I've got a few slides now to show you that particular engagement with them. So we invited them in for a number of object handling sessions in the planning stages of the exhibition so that they could select, help Melissa and me with the selection of objects and think about how the objects should be displayed and the sorts of um, information that should be included in the didactic panels on the wall. They then came back and were filmed in the syndicate room of the museum, handling and discussing some of the objects that were going in the exhibition together with some of their own objects that told food stories and were important to them. And these conversations were recorded. The film crew then went back to Rowan Arts Centre, where the group were um, recorded making a meal together and, um, as it were, breaking bread and sharing food memories. Um, and then they were filmed coming back once the exhibition had been open to the public, again, seeing how the objects were displayed and how their input had um, impacted on our decision making. 
and you can see that actually they made for us a wonderful uh, plate of uh, fake trompe l'oeil profiteroles and also we displayed some of their ceramic plates in the creative zone so that actually their artworks could be considered along with the historic um, works of art in the exhibition and enjoyed equally by the members of the public. And again, they then came back throughout the run of the exhibition to gain further inspiration from the exhibition. The second community group with whom we engaged quite fully were the North Cambridge Academy student ambassadors. Um, we have a long standing link with this particular school. And again, these uh, students came in and they handled some of the exhibits before the exhibition and we recorded their reactions and their uh, um, food um, uh, memories with these objects. And again, once the exhibition was open, again, they were filmed engaging and sharing thoughts um, and memories about food for the film. And the final group is our wonderful, uh, the more elderly contingent, the seniors from the Dancing in the Museum programme. Again, this group has come in um, for a number of years and um, know the museum very, very well, feel very comfortable. And again, we pre-recorded conversations with objects from our own collection and from their own homes being brought in. Um, and you see Melissa trying on a wonderful apron that they brought in with one of their mother's own aprons that had been used um, in service. And again, the film crew went back to their sheltered housing and recorded them having conversations again over a meal and then again, they were recorded coming back to the uh, exhibition um, and sharing their memories of that. And then we had a wonderful celebratory feast uh, with the uh, seniors and with the Rowan um, art students coming together um, to talk about food. Again, it was all filmed. Um, and then this exhibition, uh, the, the film was put in the exhibition so the general public could benefit from that experience of those diverse local community groups. I'm afraid I don't have time to um, read out these um, comments about the responses that the engagement meant for these diverse groups, but hopefully you can re-watch the film afterwards, but I think you can see the impact of that. Moving rapidly on, I now just want to share with you a few slides about some of our key public programmes that were again designed to bring in different diverse community groups um, to maximise engagement. So I've got a couple of slides here you can see with our blind and partially sighted programme, where again we were talking to them before the exhibition went up about how we might think about tactile experiences uh, and multi-sensory experiences within the exhibition. And then you can see one of the members of the group with her guide dog um, actually in the exhibition. We also have a very long standing programme with uh, those suffering uh, um, living with dementia and their carers. And again, uh, we brought them into discussions both before the exhibition and during the exhibition so that we could benefit from their experiences and that they could um, um, really engage in a meaningful way with the exhibition. And you can hear, see here some of them creating artworks um, afterwards. Um, we then, through the learning team, have a very, very rich programme for audiences from um, all different ages. I wanted to share with you um, some um, slides now to do with the um, Cambridge City Council funded um, programme for early years families called Talking and Eating Together. These were for families from um, a slightly disadvantaged area of Cambridge. Um, and we brought them in multiple times to um, share songs and stories and looking at some of the exhibits in the exhibition. There were then food themed play and creative activities um, in, the, um, in the art studio. You can see the children with their parents and with their carers um, having a nice time. Um, we also made sure that every time they came in, they got a very decent meal. It was all nicely laid up with proper cutlery and crockery. And the idea was to encourage proper conversations um, around um, the table um, and exploring language around food and also um, to make sure, as I say, that um, they got um, around um, a, a, you know, a, full, a full meal every time they came into the museum. There was lots of widening participation. So this are a couple of um, um, school children from the Cromwell Community College participation programme. In this case, they came into the museum and handled objects that were similar 
to those objects in the exhibition and they understood why they were made and how they were used and the stories around them. And then they went into the exhibition spaces and you can see them pouring over some of the exhibits and having a, a more engaged time because of that object handle engagement. Ditto, we had object handling um, sessions for um, the widening participation, taste of days for many different um, faculties and departments within the university. And these are some um, sixth formers uh, coming in and handling food related items um, from the art history department's widening participation taste today. And we hope that some of these students will actually then feel more encouraged um, to engage with Cambridge University and to apply to read at the university because um, they have a certain familiarity uh, with it. Moving rapidly on, um, just again to explain um, how um, really from um, toddlers to uh, the more elderly groups, uh, we, we did a number of engagement programmes. So these are for the babies, baby magic uh, in the exhibition. Uh, and we have a toddler programme again, led by a wonderfully very experienced um, 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 colleagues in the learning department, again with a lot of looking at objects and then the creative responses as a result. The Young Families Programme, again this is um, um, a late that um, Rachel and, uh, uh, and um, uh, Melissa will remember, very cold evening but um, lots of outdoor activities around the giant pineapple and this was creating um, pineapple flavoured sherbet um, for the children um, to take home. And then again, different responses, different engagement. So um, how people can move and um, be dynamic in front of the exhibits in the exhibition um, for all different um, age groups. Um, and then um, academic teaching uh, programs going on. So bringing in students from art history, from the history faculty, theology, uh, modern languages and so on. Um, we did a number of lates. This was during Lent. And this was called uh, faith, uh, food, faith, uh, 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 and so on. And uh, we had a, a wonderful interfaith student panel discussion um, about, um, uh, you know, um, uh, food, faith, and fasting. Um, and you can see it was very well attended. And I think it was very interesting for the public to be able to engage with, as it were, real life Cambridge University undergraduate, and to hear the difficulties that some of these students had getting kosher products or how they managed to deal with fasting during exam periods uh, and so on. We had a public uh, conference again to engage at a different level thinking about the global pineapple and this was the mad um, um, opening event with bumpers and par around the pineapple and then um, again um, some of the engagement programs so this is our wonderful colleague Lauren um, Gardner at the herbarium showing some um, specimens um, and so on. Vicky, I think we're going to have to... Um... Sorry, I'm going to move on very rapidly. Sorry, yeah. Um, I think... And yeah, sorry. And then just very, very quickly. So engagement, we created a creative zone whereby um, the public could watch the film, look at their own ceramics and also engage with um, creating their own um, still life. And here are some of the public responses to that. We had a feedback wall where the public were able to record their um, three words that resonated most with them and we displayed those. And again, this is the public um, responses uh, to that. I'm afraid we don't have time to go through those now. Some literary responses. And then finally, um, Fitz Billies did a wonderful response um, to the exhibition by um, celebrating the art of a patissier um, uh, and then they had a little bit of publicity in the window um, showing the public down the road to the exhibition. So I think for me and Melissa it was a wonderful um, opportunity to engage in a very rich way with diverse publics um, so we'd just like to thank all our collaborators and creative partners for everything that we learned from um, their engagement with the exhibition and I'll stop there. Apologies Thank for you. overrunning. <laughs> Thank you. Not unexpected. Thank you, Vicky. Very nice to see those images again. And for those of you who've asked about the exhibition, there is a really outstanding exhibition website and a catalogue. So 
um, it no longer exists, the exhibition. So moving on to Bernard Fulda, please go ahead and, and share your screen, Bernard. So here we go. Thank you very much, Melissa, for the invitation. And um, a warm welcome to everyone. Just to say that Melissa asked me to explain the Nolde exhibition, which I co-curated together with my wife, Aya Zoika, in Berlin's Nationalgalerie in uh, 2019 and to talk about the controversies that this triggered, and then to talk about the public engagement, and finally to offer some reflections about um, being an academic historian doing public history. And now I think it will be better to leave the latter for the Q&A, because the problem is that whilst in Germany, Emil Nolde may well be a household name with a resonance like William Turner in Britain, very few people in the UK have actually ever come across the name of Emil Nolde, let alone his artworks. So since 10 minutes is not a lot to introduce one of the pioneers of German expressionism and his ambiguous role during National Socialism, I thought it would make sense to show you the short report about our exhibition, which was shown on German primetime TV the night before the exhibition opening in April 2019. Um, let me just see. For some reason, it doesn't. There we go. In terms of background knowledge, what you will need to know is that when Angela Merkel took office as chancellor in 2005, she requested two works by Nolde for her office and declared that he was her favorite artist. We wanted one of those uh, works for our show. In fact, the one just um, on uh, underneath which Obama is sitting here and um, sent together with our loan request letter um, to advance copies of our two volume catalog, uh, which then resulted in, on the one hand, Merkel agreeing to our loan request and on the other, her purging her office of both and all the works. And that caused quite a lot of controversy in Germany at the time. And in order to give you some taste for that, uh, I am going to show you uh, that if that is now working, that uh, short news broadcast, uh, which was um, uh, produced by ZDF, which is like news at 10, essentially. So let me let me try this. Um, and if your German is a little bit rusty, don't worry, YouTube has a fantastic subtitling, uh, as it were, um, thing, which will hopefully work. So here we go. Dem Verfolgungswahn der Nazis entkamen selbst jene nicht, die selber Nazis waren. Das ist in einem Satz zusammengefasst die Geschichte des Malers Emil Nolde. Geradezu verzweifelt versuchte er, Adolf Hitler zu gefallen. Doch es gelang ihm nicht, weil seine expressionistische Kunst für entartet erklärt worden war. Dass die Künstlerlegende Emil Nolde ein Antisemit und Hitler-Verehrer war, wird der breiten Öffentlichkeit erst seit kurzem bewusst. Auch für Bundeskanzlerin Merkel war das neu. Und so hat sie inzwischen Nolde-Bilder abgehängt, die als Leihgabe in ihrem Arbeitszimmer hingen, darunter der Brecher von 1936. Dieses und andere berühmte Werke Noldes sind derzeit im Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin zu sehen. In einer Ausstellung, die sich mit der Nazi-Vergangenheit Noldes auseinandersetzt. Stefan Naseburger hat sie sich angesehen. Emil Nolde, der Meister der kräftigen Farben, Stern des deutschen Expressionismus, den die Nazis ächteten, war selbst ein Nazi und glühender Antisemit. Und zwar bis zum Untergang des Dritten Reiches. Das belegt eine Vielzahl von Dokumenten in der Ausstellung im Hamburger Bahnhof. Ende Mai 1943 schreibt Emil Neude seiner Frau Ada, eine Handvoll Juden hinter den Regierungen und Banken ihrer Weltmächte geborgen, schmunzelnd sitzend, finanzieren und schüren diesen weltumspannenden, grausamen Krieg. Jahrzehntelang waren die Archive der Neude Stiftung in Seebüll verschlossen. Vor sechs Jahren hat Direktor Christian Ring beschlossen, Neudes Nachlass endlich zu öffnen. Ich bin erstaunt, weil das ist natürlich ein Ergebnis, was ich am Anfang nicht vermutet hätte. Wirklich dieses Festhalten am nationalsozialistischen Regime bis zum Ende des Zweiten Weltkrieges, dieser widerliche Antisemitismus, da hätte ich mir schon auch vorher eine Abkehr von Neude gewünscht. Musik 
1937 diffamierten die Nazis moderne Kunst als kulturzersetzend. Parteimitglied Nolde war geschockt, dass viele seiner Werke beschlagnahmt und in der Ausstellung entartete Kunst gezeigt wurden. Er hielt es für einen großen Irrtum. Tatsächlich hatte Nolde unter den Nazis auch Verehrer. Es gibt für Nolde, neben den vielen Anfeindungen, denen er sich natürlich nur allzu sehr bewusst ist, eine Vielzahl von Hinweisen, dass er unter den höchstrangigen Vertretern des nationalsozialistischen Deutschlands eine ganz beeindruckende Anzahl von Anhängern und Bewunderern hat. Aber Hitler verachtete Noldes Kunst. Trotzdem zählte er bis 1941 zu den bestverdienenden deutschen Malern. 1938 schrieb er an Propagandaminister Goebbels, der Nolde bis zu seiner Verfemung als Künstler schätzte. Meine Kunst ist deutsch, stark, herb und innig. Ab 1938 malte Nolde, der so gerne Staatskünstler gewesen wäre, Wikingerbilder, Burgen und Feuer. Motive aus der nordischen Sagenwelt, vereinbar mit der Nazi-Ideologie. 1941 erhielt er Berufsverbot, durfte nicht verkaufen. Nolde machte daraus nach dem Krieg ein Malverbot. Er verklärte sich als Opfer des Regimes, strickte erfolgreich an seiner Legende. Helmut Schmidt und Angela Merkel hingen Nolde-Gemälde ins Kanzleramt. Ich würde mir mit dieser Ausstellung und mit den neuesten Erkenntnissen auch in meine Wohnung kein Nolde mehr hängen. Die Kanzlerin hat den Brecher und ein weiteres Noldewerk inzwischen abhängen lassen. Zu heikel. Das war's. So, that was, that was the, the news broadcast. And you can imagine that with, a, um, with free publicity like that, um, we had uh, quite... A number of people wanting to show the uh, see the show. So um, at the opening, people were ready to queue for hours to be allowed into the exhibition space. Uh, first weekend, one of the visitors fainted because of the poor air conditions in the venue. Um, uh, and afterwards, and indeed for the rest of the show, uh, access was given only by way of time tickets because the local air conditioning simply could not cope with the masses. Being part of the waiting queue became something of a thing to post on Instagram, apparently, and I've given you a sample of, of some of these posts. At the end of its five-month run, uh, the exhibition had attracted 150,000 visitors and could easily have drawn twice that if the location had allowed for it. So what about public engagement? The Gerda Henkel Foundation uh, funded a four-part video documentary of the Nolde Research Project, which is available online and which was released with the opening of the exhibition. Most of the other outreach and public engagement activities you will find documented on the de dedicated exhibition webpage, Emil Nolde in Berlin. As far as I'm concerned, the most important component of this public engagement was actually the two-volume exhibition catalogue, Volume one with essays on various aspects of Nolde during National Socialism and volume two, a source edition of over 100 previously unpublished letters and documents and a comprehensive chronology of Nolde's life uh, during the Nazi dictatorship. These two books provided insights into the research project that underpinned the exhibition and they guarantee the long term and indeed the academic impact of the show. But of course, there was also a range of genuine public engagement activities. We offered a variety of guided tours, uh, giving a number of curated tours, as well as training the museum's freelance tour guides. We organized a series of talks by other experts with whom we engaged in dialogue. And we co-organized a three-day international conference in the museum on art during National Socialism, uh, which was open to the public. There were also events under the heading change of perspectives where speakers from other fields were invited to give tours of the exhibition. For example, the director of the Sachsenhausen Concentration Camp Museum offered a tour on the theme of biography and memory, um, discussing how to represent biographies in an exhibition and how events affect the self-narration of individuals. On the crucial theme of anti-Semitism, we had a colleague from Berlin's Jewish Museum offer a public dialogue uh, of manifestations of anti-Semitism then and now. There was also a separate school program for GCSE and A-level students. 
with two workshop themes, one focusing on the contrast between what their school books said about Nolan National Socialism and what they encountered in our exhibition, and the other a writing workshop dealing with art criticism and inviting students to produce their own reviews of specific artworks uh, and or the exhibition. Unfortunately, I can't, unlike Vicky, uh, show you any of the outputs of these workshops because we as curators were never actually provided with information on that. And I think that was one of the weaknesses of the National Gallery. Um, for me, the most interesting manifestation of public engagement happened actually in a non-organized fashion within the exhibition's visitor books. In total, visitors filled nearly over six 200-page A5 booklets with their comments. The longest entry ran over three pages and contained eight subheadings. Um, although unusually long, it was not untypical of the highly personal responses noted by many visitors. People commented on all kinds of things, on Merkel's purging of her office, the question of whether it was possible to distinguish between oeuvre and author, between artworks and the artist's biography, on the very apparent public need for hero worship, and much more. There were numerous observations of the kind reproduced on this slide, reflections about how the exhibition had changed visitors' image of Nolde's art and how this deconstruction of the Nolde myth had a personal dimension for them individually or indeed for their parents' generation. Of course, there were also highly critical voices accusing the curators of character assassination and of denigrating the genius artist. One question that came up time and again in the visitor entries and during our many guided tours was what consequences this exhibition should have for future presentations of Nolde's works. There is, of course, much more that could be said, but I will stop here, though not without counting our blessings. The exhibition that we created was meant to be an immersive and educational experience in the real physical world was the culmination of seven years of hard work, and we were extremely lucky to make it happen before COVID entered the stage. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you very much. Um, interesting what you say about the curators and the education team not kind of working together, because I think that with the Fitzwilliam um, I think we're very lucky to, to have a kind of dialogue because I think it really is important also in the kind of way in which you put together an exhibition as well, kind of engaging with communities even before it gets to the stage of making the exhibition. Thank you. Okay, Rachel Sinfield, you're next. Hmm. Hello, can you see the screen okay there? Perfect, thank you. Great, okay. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, yeah, here we are. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that um, for me, the first-hand experience of engaging with art firsthand is, um, you know, one of the things that made me want to work in museums in the first place. So working through the pandemic has not necessarily been the easiest thing. Um, however, what I wanted to share with you today, um, let's go back to the beginning. Sorry, I'll just get to the first slide. Yeah, what I wanted to share with you today were two, two ways in which we had engaged at the Fitzwilliam with people digitally during the pandemic. When we had to close our doors at the Fitzwilliam in March 2020, um, like museums all over the world, we had to think of new ways of engaging our audiences. So I have two digital successes that we've had in the last year, which I'd like to share. Um, and the f Instagram and podcasts. Now, we actually post on social media across different platforms every day. We post on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, but the biggest increase in our followers has been on Instagram, and it's been quite striking. It is a very visual platform. And in January 2020, after about four years of posting on Instagram, we had about 15,000 followers, a fairly modest following. Well, as of today's date, we're just short of 30,000. So that's doubled during the course of the pandemic. Um, 
this post that I'm sharing with you now, um, I just really wanted to focus on one post to sort of make the point about the benefits of get, getting that kind of audience. Um, we posted uh, in March of this year, um, three images of the botanical art of Barbara Deach. Um, the three images set the work of, um, we've got three Im images in total. Let's go to slide three. So the three images set the work of Dietscher in the context of other botanical artists. It compares her studies to um, artists, studies from nature from artists like Leonardo and Dürer, but it leads on to how the beginning of the scientific revolution towards the end of the Renaissance led to, to botanical art becoming a pursuit in its own right. To construct posts of this kind, we blend curatorial knowledge and expertise from colleagues like Vicky and uh, people from across different disciplines across the museum. But we combine that with the skills of the comms team so that they can space and present, um, use hashtags and emojis and link to um, ways in which people can be called to action through these posts. In this case, linking to a forthcoming exhibition which will be coming up when the museum reopens. Um, and also captioning of the images. So this was the second image on the post. And as we come to the third, you can probably see that it achieved um, likes of 2,305. But actually I'd like to share with you a little bit more if we drill down into the insights on Instagram, uh, we can find out more about the sort of impact that a post of this kind can have. Um, it prompted 35 comments and questions, but it reached 45,775 accounts, 83% of which were not following the Fitzwilliam. This one post resulted in 222 visits to our Instagram profile and 36 new followers. Now, interestingly, who are those followers? Well, 10.5% of them live in London, more than 7.4% who are based in Cambridge, and we have 1.9% of our followers living in New York. 28.5% of the followers are aged 25 to 34, and in fact, two thirds of the audience on Instagram are under 44. And that we know from surveys we do of people visiting us on site um, is actually quite a bit younger. So, you know, already you can see that through this, we're actually able to reach an audience which is further afield and younger. So whatever your feelings about social media, and I share some of those, even though I have to work with it, um, sometimes Twitter is just poisonous. <laughs> but actually, I think Instagram used in this way, it actually can be a fantastic way for us to draw people into the museum for the first time and to connect them with our collections and research. Uh, in addition, another aspect of us having to be closed um, because of COVID is that we've had to introduce a free but ticketed entry system to the museum. And that in itself is building up an audience for us as well. So I'll leave some of those stats behind and perhaps um, and go on to our second project that I wanted to share with you, which was us returning to the field of podcasts. In the early 2000s, when um, the go-to gadget for everyone was to have an, uh, an iPod, um, we, we did dip our toe into podcasts and we did a certain number which were very successful. Um, but actually we had let that go to rather dormant for many years. Um, and it was actually in the first COVID lockdown beginning in March, that we and our audiences found ourselves suddenly cut off from the collections held within the museum, and it got us thinking. On any visit to the museum, we may walk past hundreds of objects, but only if a, a small number will stay with us. And we thought about questions that that raises. How do these artworks continue to exist in our mind, uh, in our memories and our imaginations? And how do they influence the art that some of us might want to make inspired by those objects? So that was the starting point for um, an idea for a series of podcasts, and we commissioned five artists and writers to answer these questions. Now, all five of those artists and writers had been people that we had worked with before. Um, they had an existing relationship with the Fitzwilliam. Each one of them chose an artwork that resonated with them and produced a new creative response to that artwork, but in their own isolation, their own social isolation. 
They shared this experience of the process through conversations that form the basis of the series of podcasts. And these artists have diverse practices and interests spanning the visual arts and literature. We appointed um, Carmen Price, who's a trained journalist and broadcaster who lives in Cambridge. She's worked with ITV and BBC in the past, uh, and she became our producer and host for this series. Part of that job was actually conducting interviews which had to be done remotely, um, quite often down the line, um, but it meant we had to send, for instance, headsets with microphones to Shropshire and County Kilkenny, where two of the artists were spending their respective lockdowns. So there were all sorts of challenges, timetabling the interviews, um, quite a lot of sound engineering to actually make sure that the um, all the sound was of a consistent quality. Um, but we got there, the podcasts fortuitously, <laughs> fortuitously were ready for the second lockdown, um, which began in October. And um, let me move on so that you can see some of the work that we did. The first podcast featured the writer, Ali Smith. And um, she actually did a wonderful uh, opening for the series called Elegy, um, Elegy in a Cup and Saucer. Um, she begins by asking us, where have you been in your dreams in lockdown? And her dream takes us through the Fitzwilliams galleries, pausing at paintings she has known since she first visited the museum as a postgrad student in 1985. Finally, she reaches, and I quote, a tiny, glowing and haunting painting, White Cup and Saucer by Henri Fantin Latour. And the podcast goes on after her elegy, which lasts for about 11 minutes. Then Luke Sison, our director, discusses the painting with Jane Munro, our keeper of paintings, drawings and prints. The second podcast in the series features Halima Cassell. Uh, now, Halima is a ceramic artist. Um, Vicky will know her well. She worked with us. Um, her, her piece, Virtues of Unity, was exhibited in our Things of Beauty Growing exhibition in 2017 to 18. And we are fortunate to have her work featured in the collection. Now, her memory actually was inspired by a visit to the museum shop. And she remembers um, the work, um, botanical art illustrations of an artist called Clarence Bicknell, but his works follow an incredible geometric, um, geometric pattern. And although they're from very different times and starting points, both she and Bicknell were inspired by plant formations and the geometry and symmetry found in the natural world. She recognized the grid um, or scaffolding as he called it, as just one of the techniques they shared. And she said, I love symmetry and I love complex design made from a simple shape that's repeated. Now, what I've done in each of these slides, and I'm going to have a link at the end, is a link to each of the podcasts. And it'll actually, actually take you to the page on our website, which gives you some supplementary material and the scripts as well. But just to go through the last three. Issam Korbaj, also resident in Cambridge, um, Issam was drawn to something from his birthplace in Syria. And in his mind's eye, he recalled three small eye idols, 5,000 years old from the ancient Syria city of Tel Brak. And Issam asked questions like, what is the future of my past? His artwork, although inspired by the past, very much focuses on the, um, the situation that his, his fellow Syrians find themselves. He created sculptures of the eye idols, some 500 of them, um, like everyone's family watching what was happening in the world. He used soap from Aleppo and he carved while blindfolded. The soap, he felt, reminds us to wash our hands during our COVID crisis, but also that the world cannot wash its hands of all that is going on. So that is uh, a podcast which explains, in which he explains the symbolism beautifully. Um, we then come on to Jackie Kay. Uh, Jackie Kay describes her discovery of this pre-Raphaelite muse, um, Fanny Eaton, as two time worlds coming together with modern technology providing the portal which brought this black Victorian into her house. By that, she means that she didn't actually see this paint. This drawing actually is kept in store a lot of the time because obviously it's graphite, um, we, you know, we, we have to protect it. It's brought out for exhibitions and it was exhibited at the National Portrait Gallery in the Pre-Raphaelite Sisterhood exhibition. Um, she discovered it through our online catalogue of paintings. Um, 
she immediately identified with Fanny. Fanny was born in Jamaica in 1835, and this graphite drawing of her by Simeon Solomon feels very vivid to Jackie, as if she is right there. Um, discussing Fanny's life leads Jackie to talk about how we need more black work in our galleries, paintings of black people or by black people who have been hidden from history. And she develops these thoughts in the poem that she reads at the end of the podcast, Fanny Eaton, the Pre-Raphaelite Jamaican Muse. And then finally, oh, Matt Smith. Um, Matt Smith's lockdown, he was the one who was um, in County Kilkenny. And he actually recalled being in the space of the Fitzwilliam, in Gallery 6 in particular. It's the long gold gallery that holds the early Renaissance paintings. And actually the walls themselves, um, they reveal memories of where paintings have been hung in the past. There are effects of light and marks of use revealing the passage of time. So this led Matt to an early photographic process called cyanotypes, um, which uses paper, light, and two chemicals. Um, and it's often been used in the past to create flower prints. That then led him to think about the paintings by artist Rachel Roish in our Gallery 17, our flower gallery. And actually Matt in his podcast then makes a connection from Roish's paintings to the decriminalization of homosexuality. I'll leave you to listen to the podcast to find that out. Um, so In My Mind's Eye gave us a chance to launch our new podcast series, archive, um, bring back to life our archive of podcasts from, uh, podcasts from the past. And it's actually something that um, we are working on a second series of podcasts with our collections colleagues, which are going to be looking at recent acquisitions from artists of colour for the Fitzwilliam Museum's permanent galleries. So here are the links of what I've been talking about. Um, and many thanks for listening.